So um, thanks, everyone. I, I will um, just remind you that I am, I am not Connie Yao from the MacArthur Foundation. Um, I, uh, in D.C., there's a, a place um, called Wonderland. Any of you from the nation's capital? You know Wonderland? It's on 11th Street. I don't know if they still do this, but on, on Mondays, uh, for a while, they were doing PowerPoint karaoke. Uh, which is exactly what it sounds like. You get up there, and uh, they would for five minutes they would show some random PowerPoint uh, deck, and you had to, with a microphone, uh, make it up and narrate it uh, as you go along. So, okay, I'm like the giant fuzzy things coming after me. Um, and so I, I promise this won't degenerate into uh, into PowerPoint karaoke, um, but just to. When, in talking with Connie and being here for the last couple of days, I just knew that when I, I heard Connie wasn't going to be here, we had to have connected learning as part of the discussion here at South by Southwest. So, you know, I'm a little not, I'm certainly not as well versed in this as she is, but um, what I'd like to do today is to give you a, an overview of connected learning. We'll have some discussion about that. Uh, I have an ether pad that I'll throw up and we'll use to do some interactive discussion. And then at the end, there'll be an opportunity uh, for you to, uh, on the ether pad, leave your organization's uh, name, your contact information, and specifically how you'd like to be part of this conversation moving forward. And Connie and I will work together to make sure that then you're connected because they're putting together a process about how to, to better move this forward. Um, so, uh, connected learning. First, what is it? Um, you know, connected learning really reimagines uh, the learning experience across uh, peer interest and academic spheres. And so, what we're looking here is a, this Venn diagram. This is the simple definition, is that we have uh, student interests, we have peer culture and peer interaction, and then we have uh, academic advancement. And what I'd like to do is just take a minute to show a video uh, from a, a website that's really our intro video to Connected Learning. It's about seven minutes. Um, I show this to everybody I can anyway and hope that you do the same. Um, the way that you get to this is through uh, connectedlearning.tv uh, and it's just on the, the, main, webs the main page. Uh, so we'll pull it up if you can give us some audio here. is no longer a promised future for all kids. If people don't really learn how to learn and how to engage and how to be flexible and adaptive and find communities and have ideas about things that they want to do now, we're just really in trouble. If we're going to compete with everyone else, then we can no longer say let's only educate a, a segment of society. We have to educate everyone and we have to educate everyone to be creative and to think about things, which means we have to completely overhaul our education system. We have to completely overhaul, overhaul how we think learning happens and where it happens and who's, who's capable of learning. There's a sense in which, in all kinds of registers uh, and, and indices, um, yeah, our institutions have to some degree, not completely, but to some degree failed us and failed our children. And, uh, you know, the passion on our side is to try and uh, open it up to find the ways in which learning um, and our learning institutions no longer fail us, that they actually become environments, ecologies, uh, sites, spaces of excitement and engagement and interest and passion um, that delight learners uh, at all ages. We really think that, the, that part of what's wrong with the current educational system and why people talk about it as broken is because it's fundamentally starting with the wrong questions. The educational system often now starts with a question of outcomes. It starts with what do we want kids to learn? What are the goals? And what's the content? What's the material that they need to cover? And then everything is defined by that. It doesn't almost matter who the kid is 
so long as we're going on pace through the material and through the content and reaching those educational standards or those outcomes, because that's our starting point. Our core question is, what's the experience we want kids to have? So the core question is around engagement. And as soon as you start with, is the kid engaged? What is the learning experience we want the kid to have? Then you have to pay attention to the kid. How do you create a need to know in a kid? That's an emotional question. That's an intellectual question. That's an identity question. And when you start designing learning experiences around that, then getting to the content and getting kids to engage in core questions related to academic core, that's actually the easy part. In school, we drum that out of kids. We so decontextualize what they're learning, we take it out of context and just teach them discrete facts because we're so focused on these outcomes that we've forgotten the learner and we've forgotten that we actually have a passion for learning. We're so used to now giving responsibility for learning to professionals instead of looking at how it's part of the fabric of our interactions with everybody. Education has been framed for a long time as somebody else's job, right? It's the job of the schools, it's the job of teachers. Schools can't possibly bear the burden, the sole burden of educating young people. All of this, the spaces, the churches, the home spaces, families, um, you know, the neighborhood coffee shop, the person online across the world that's doing really interesting things. Those are all people and groups that can help own the learning of, of any particular young person and really can contribute. So part of this conversation is trying to open up the question of who contributes and who is, is ultimately responsible for helping young people survive and thrive and grow up to be curious, engaged citizens. What we've heard from kids over and over again through all of our research is that school's a node on their network of learning so that they in fact are learning everywhere now in part because of digital media and in part because they always have. The problem is effective matchmaking. So how does a kid find that mentor or that peer who is going to introduce them or support them in developing their interests, making their interests relevant, developing a sense of purpose. Um, and it's not about actually finding the information anymore. How can we use the capacity of these network resources, these social connections, to bring people together who want to learn together? And not the model of how can we deliver content more effectively from a single source to many listeners. And that's fundamentally reconfiguring what we think of as the problem and goal of education. The challenge is there's so much there, and how do I figure out what to hone in on and what to focus in on? that works for you, and works for me, and works for, you know, the other kid. And that's going to be, uh, that's going to be the hard part, because the, the older approach is to say, well, I don't need to think about it, because we're all going to learn the same way. And we're all going to learn these 10 facts, we're all going to read these 10 books, and we're going to all write these 10 essays. That's, you know, those days are gone. We had this um, almost embarrassment of riches, in some sense, of so many different pieces that are on the table, but we still have to figure out how to put those pieces together. We have a broad set of principles and a broad set of ideas that we think need to be at the core of learning for the 21st century. And that those principles and designs need to start with the notion of connectedness. I think our greatest aspiration is that this becomes the kernel of a set of ideas that enable a lot of people in a wide range of spheres and fields to take it up and do something with it. It's about 
expertise that's widely distributed in our society and culture and the fact that anybody can help somebody else get better at something. It is absolutely a work in progress. I don't want to say this too strongly, uh, but it's a work that should never be finished. It's a work that should always be in progress and it's a work that should never be afraid to fail. Great, so there again, um, for those of you that would like to see this again or share it with others, uh, connectedlearning.tv is the website uh, where you can get to this video. So, you know, as we talk about connected learning, um, connected learning is really um, bridging these traditional red schoolhouse, these academic skills, uh, with students' uh, creative uh, and, uh, and analytic skills. You know, we, we look at, um, you know, here's a quote from a book, Makers, The New Industrial Revolution from Chris Anderson. The past 10 years have been about discovering new ways to create, invent, and work together on the web. The next 10 years will be about applying those lessons to the real world. So we think that the same is true for education. Uh, but unfortunately, we have, uh, we're stuck in a bit of a rut. Uh, right now, if you uh, talk with folks that are working on digital learning transitions in school districts across the country, unfortunately, they're too often more concerned with whether or not their uh, transition is aligned with common core standards than they are with how is what we're doing going to boost uh, student engagement. Uh, we have a s two sets of conversations going on, and I've seen them happen uh, here over the last couple days. We have those people that are talking about schools and school districts, and then we have makerspace, right? And these are two very useful worlds. These are two very useful conversations. The challenge that we face and that we have to take on, uh, and we'll, this will, in fact, make connected learning happen, is how do we bridge across those? Um, I'm going to be doing a session actually at noon uh, that will dig into the nuts and bolts on that a little bit more with Jeff Edmondson from Strive. But I just wanted to present that as a challenge uh, and a problem that we have to tackle. So MacArthur uh, did this. I love this slide. Um, so if you can't read it at the top, Facebook is the people you went to school with. Twitter is the people you wish you went to school with. So. Um, MacArthur uh, funded a very large ethnographic study. As many of you know, they're deeply engaged in research on this issue. Um, Mimi Ito, uh, who was there in the video, uh, we encourage you to, to look at her research, in particular her report called uh, Hanging Out, Messing Around, and Geeking Out. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So MacArthur funded an ethnographic study of more than 700 young people in the U.S. involving more than 25 researchers. Um, and there were lots of seminal findings in that research, but let me just tell you about one of them. Uh, turns out there's two uh, major ways that young people participate online. That, uh, that number one, it's about friendship. Uh, and then secondly, it's interest-driven. And so if we look at interest-driven, um, Harry, po here's a great example, the Harry Potter websites. Um, these are these really um, massive communities. There are a number of them on different functional areas. Um, it's interest-driven learning. Um, it's uh, young people mostly pursuing their interests. Uh, they're getting good at what, uh, at things that they care about. Um, they're, you know, showing up in, in game sites and fan fiction sites, uh, chess or science sites, knitting sites, pottery sites, craft sites, uh, Pinterest. You know, it could be a fan fiction site like Harry Potter, uh, or it could be uh, an anime site. Um, but what happens is that they're getting uh, immediate feedback on what they're doing. So young people interacting with their peers in ways that are aligned with their interests, and they're getting immediate uh, feedback on this. So just, just one example about how this relates to student achievement and academic progress. Um, Constance Steinkuhler, who's a games researcher at the University of Wisconsin, uh, finished a study on reading in massive multi-online game called RuneScape, uh, where players also participate in a social network around the game. Um, and she had a set of high school students uh, from rural Wisconsin that were having trouble in school uh, that were playing this game. Uh, and they, these uh, high school students had tested approximately at the fifth grade or sixth grade reading level. Um, 
once they became avid members of the RuneScape community, uh, which actually had pretty intense reading requirements, um, she tested their in-game reading levels and found out they were actually reading at a college level. So this solves you know, one of the problems that we're paying a lot of attention to at the Department of Education, which is you know, how, do we, how do we get students to persist? You know, some people have referred to this as, as non-cognitive factors, right? Even those, even those of us who are using this are getting away from that. But things like persistence and grit uh, and resilience, it's showing up in these online communities. Uh, and we know that, in fact, you know, from, from uh, Angela Duckworth's research and others, that the, the uh, emotion that's most often shown by young people when they're learning, what do you think that is? What emotion is that when they're actually learning? It's frustration. So they're showing that that they're frustrated, they're challenged. But what's happening in these online learning communities is because students are interested, they're willing to challenge themselves. They're willing to work at this level that Duckworth calls a deliberate practice. Uh, so uh, some anime websites are another great example. Um, you know, one of the, uh, the sort of when, when MacArthur looked at the findings, uh, their first response was like, oh crap, wow, this stuff's happening out there. Uh, and then the second response was, oh crap, it's not connected to any of these other things that we're doing in education. It's not connected to adults, it's not connected to traditional school systems. I mean, there, and, and not because of a control issue, but because of a resource issue and an alignment issue. So, you know, trying to get at this from the perspective of the kid and, and working at it that way. So, um, so what's been MacArthur's approach to doing this, and, and those of us that are pushing on connected learning, um, it's really creating context for learning, uh, creating spaces. Um, I've had the opportunity to visit and work with folks at uh, UMedia uh, Chicago uh, and the Hive Networks. Um, rather than me talking about the Hive Networks, we actually have some folks from the Pittsburgh Hive here. Matt, are you here somewhere? Could you, uh, would you be willing to come up here for just a second and, and just you know, say a few sentences about Hive and really sort of how it, it works along, you know, this, this research that Mimi's done on hanging out, messing around, and geeking out. Sure. Thanks, Michael. Sure. Hi, I'm Matt Hannigan from the Pittsburgh Hive Learning Network uh, and also the Kids and Creativity Network in Pittsburgh. And we're an organization that is helping to steward the projects and activities of more than 60 cultural organizations and informal learning organizations across the Pittsburgh region, working with universities and learning innovators in the ed tech sector and folks that are in the classroom as well. So the Hive Learning Networks are connected learning in action. The first one was established in 2007 in New York and the second one came along in Chicago in 2009. Pittsburgh's the third Hive Learning Network city and there'll be other cities uh, coming along this year like in Toronto and Athens, Greece. So the vision is to create a global community of people who are thinking about connected learning in action, trying to bring together folks to blend the experience that's happening both in school and out of school. So we at the Sprout Fund, the organization that I work for, have supported a variety of activities that have helped to bring people together and collaborate in new and interesting ways, like the Computer Science Student Network that's a Carnegie Mellon project that takes classroom-based experiences and training teachers, but also creates an online platform so that students can, can develop Stu uh, computer science skills in ways that are really effective for them and track their achievements through badging and other kinds of factors along the way. Working with our colleagues at Mozilla, which is responsible for stewarding the work of the Hive Learning Network in uh, New the New York City area, we're really looking at the opportunity to expand the way that we perceive connected learning and, and really building in a lot of the maker ethos to what's happening, recognizing that the work of connected learning is both a digital media and learning initiative, but also includes attributes of DIY and sort of bringing those two things together in online spaces. So for example, Mozilla helped steward summer code parties last year that created opportunities for hundreds of code parties to happen in communities all across the world. Uh, this summer, the, that same kind of thing will happen, but it also allows us to level up and br bring those things into collaboration with other major initiatives. So the Chicago Hive, for example, is working with the mayor's office to understand how can the same kind of ethos be built into badging and to educate students in STEAM-related initiatives throughout the course of this summer. So the Hive Learning Networks are, are three cities strong so far, but we're looking to expand this 
globally. And hopefully in the future we'll have resources available so that people can learn from the work that's happening and understand how you can build communities of practice supporting connected learning both in and out of school like we've done in Pittsburgh and has also happened in Chicago and New York. Sure, the hivelearningnetworks.org or hivelearningnetwork.org is the Hive website. It's got information about New York and Chicago, and you can find out more about Pittsburgh's work and the soon to be coming Hive that we're establishing there at remakelearning.org. Great, thanks, John. Thanks, Michael. Fantastic. So, um, so you know, this is really uh, this work to create these robust contexts for learning. Um, you know, one of the the challenges is that uh, we don't have the, really the spaces uh, for, for kids to hang out. We're, we're actually, as a culture, pretty afraid of, of teenagers hanging out together, right? Uh, and, and so we need to get beyond that. You know, here I, I certainly think that uh, public libraries uh, and museums, which play an integral role in the Hive networks, have a, a really strong role to play. Not only because they have spaces, but that they have adults that are really experts at inquiry-based learning and facilitating those processes. Um, so, you know, not only do we need more spaces where where kids can hang out, but then we need to to also create the spaces um, that we have in ways that encourage tinkering, encourage uh, this geeking out, encourage this interest-driven learning. So, um, what are the guiding principles and design features uh, of connected learning? Um, you know, just real quickly, it's shared purpose and participation. Uh, connected learning is openly networked, uh, and, connect, and connected learning is production-centered. Uh, I'll spend a little bit more time um, on these as well, but you know, you can also uh, dig in with these notes. Um, so, so what do we need to make these things happen? We're going to come back to these principles, and and the Etherpad, we're actually going to have you look at the work you're doing and how it fits in uh, to each one of these, these sections. So connectors for this, what's gonna make this possible and work? Uh, credentialing is a big piece of it. Uh, MacArthur and Mozilla have been working very closely together on the open badging initiative. Um, you know, it's uh, at the US Department of Education, we've been pushing uh, with every lever we can to push competency-based credit achievement. Uh, it was something that we pushed in Race to the Top. It's something that we've pushed in Investing in Innovation uh, and Promise Neighborhoods, uh, certainly in Race to the Top District. Uh, there are a number of projects that MacArthur has funded uh, around the Open Badging Initiative. Um, they are just now, their efforts are just now coming to fruition. And you know, this is a broad range of folks. So everyone from Disney uh, is you know, establishing some badges. Uh, to the Providence After School Alliance, uh, which is uh, one of the most well-coordinated after-school systems in the country. They're actually uh, issuing badges that are tied to academic credit, uh, course-bearing academic credit uh, for students, for middle school students uh, in particular in Providence. And so we're going to start to see uh, the results of these. Uh, obviously, there's still some things to work through on, on badging, on credentialing, uh, things like authentication, um, things like, uh, you know, whether it's actually the, the person that has the badge is the one that earned the badge. But these uh, are starting to be tackled. Um, secondly, one of the other thing we need is better assessments to match up with this. You know, right now our assessments are very segregated. We have school-based assessments, uh, after-school programs and community organizations have their own grant requirements and data requirements that they have to report. Um, so. Um, this uh, screenshot is from one of those efforts that's actually been launched by the Institute of Play uh, in New York. Uh, it's called GLASS Lab, which stands for, it's the Games Learning and Assessment Lab. Um, and GLASS Lab really looks at, um, at a shift in the way students learn and acquire knowledge um, and really recognizes the fact that digital games and simulations can support student learning and is, they've developed some assessment tools that are geared specifically uh, for those types of, of environments. Um, and then as connectors, we also need mentors. Uh, and mentors are teachers, teachers acting as mentors, as, as guides for inquiry-based uh, learning. Uh, we need uh, community-based organizations, community leaders uh, to serve this role. Um, we need schools to engage better with parents uh, in this role, engaging with parents as partners uh, in doing this work. At the Department of Education, we've actually uh, are working very intently 
on our uh, family engagement framework. Uh, we're trying to move beyond talking about family outreach and family communication and really talking about family collaboration and family cooperation. Uh, recognizing that digital learning gives us an opportunity to transform the way that teachers and parents work together. I'll be talking more about that in my noon session today. Um, so as we look at um, you know, building these, um, these ecosystems, um, we need, um, we need a, a different conversation about this. Uh, one of the other things that we have to tackle is this issue of privacy and safety. Um, you know, we, 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 ha we live in a connected world. Um, we need networking, but we also have to attend to kids' safety and privacy. But the way that we're having the conversations about kids' safety and privacy isn't helping us get to where we need to be on this. Um, we don't want to sacrifice learning for safety, and we don't want to sacrifice safety for learning. I'm not going to pretend that I have the answers to this. What I can tell you is that FERPA, uh, the law that governs uh, educational data privacy, is uh, not going, uh, it's highly unlikely it'll be reopened anytime soon. So we're dealing with uh, a law in place, uh, and so that gives us a set of constraints that we need to figure out. Uh, I truly believe that at the key to that is parent and student ownership of data that until parents and students really own their own data and can give consent to share and that becomes part of the normal education culture that we're not going to get uh, where we need to be. Um, so what I'd like you to do is for those of you, um, I, I hope pretty much everyone has a mobile device or a laptop. If you don't, uh, find one of your neighbors uh, next to you and uh, if you could pull up on the etherpad and I'll pull it up here as well. The shortcut is bit.ly um, s by sw connected. So I'll give everybody a minute to, uh, to get that pulled up on your device. If you're in, would you raise your hand? Okay, we'll give a couple more minutes here. South by South, bit.ly slash South by Southwest connected. And so, um, you know, rather than try to have a group conversation, a roundtable conversation with, you know, 60 people, um, let's have this conversation here uh, on the ether pad. And I'll, I'll pull it up so you can see what we're working with here. Yes. Uh, okay, I didn't know there was a cap on this. It's a problem. Um, f for those of you uh, who are in, can you raise your hand? Those of you who are not in, keep your hand raised, please. For those of you who are not in, um, could you um, introduce yourself to one of those people that, that is? And we're going to have a, a, this is a team building exercise, right? We're, gonna, we're dealing with the, the challenge of technology. So uh, introduce yourself, and, uh, and let's see if we can do this as a group activity. So just to give some parameters on this, um, it's 11.02 now by my clock. We're going to give 10 minutes uh, for this part of the discussion unless I start to see the, the uh, entering taper off. If it's still going, well, we could possibly extend to 15.
we're gonna keep we're gonna keep going on this, uh, but I I see some folks already starting on the next section, so I just wanted to to go ahead and give a little bit more info there. You'll see that there's this last question, which is, um, you know, which part of these conversations do you want to be part of moving forward? What do you need in order to make this happen? And then we really do want your contact information. Um, so I'm going to be working with Connie. Uh, and some other folks to follow up uh, with you. So, you know, if you want to put your contact information at the bottom, you can do that. If you want to put it next to one of your comments, that's fine. Wherever, if you can just make sure that we have it and you can put, a, you know, some sort of indicator, if you'd like, about what in particular you want to, to be uh, engaged with on this. So uh, we'll keep going. It's 11.11 now. We'll keep going on this uh, till 11.20, and then we'll just take the last 10 minutes for some open discussion.
All right. Uh, just by a show of hands, who is uh, who's still working on the Etherpad? Okay. What I'd like to do then is just you know for these last ten minutes, um, open it up uh, for discussion, uh, comments. Uh, this pad will continue to to be open. So. You know, if there are other things that you, you think of later, uh, if you didn't get a chance to put your contact info in there, uh, once again, the shortcut is bit.ly uh, slash uh, South by Southwest connected. Um, any, any questions or observations uh, in this? I can't guarantee that I'll be able to answer questions as well as Connie could. But uh, if you do, please, uh, please go to one of the microphones. It's going once. Going twice? Yeah, no, that's quite all right. Um, I was just, if folks had uh, questions or observations they'd like to share with me or the group, um, then it looks like our Etherpad discussion was successful because folks uh, were able to be heard there. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for sticking with me in Connie's absence. Uh, once again, I will be presenting with Jeff Edmondson from the Strive Network at noon uh, over at the Hilton on digital learning and collective impact. We'll dig into this issue about things being uh, separated between schools and communities and families and some ideas that we're working on how you actually uh, execute uh, to bridge those gaps. So thanks again, everyone.